Okay, so welcome to the web, today's webinar on WordPress fundamentals. And also we have the run sheet, which I, I run through as part of the, um, the webinar. So in that case, you can follow along and you can also um, use it after the webinar. So you can um, have a look at my links and references, that sort of stuff. And you can also, if you're then looking at the video of the webinar later on, then you can also see which bits um, so that way you can just fast forward to a certain part that you'd like to, to use. And I'm going to just start with what is WordPress because um, as, well, as well as introducing WordPress today, I also want to um, ensure that WordPress is the right tool for you and discuss some concepts that are around like deciding WordPress is right for you. Um, and I always will uh, start my webinars with um, introducing a background image here. And this is by Sarah Lloyd. And this is the very um, exciting term called slime mold. Now the word's not um, that romantic. However, they're very beautiful um, organisms. They grow, they might, you need a magnifying glass to see them. These specific ones come from the Tarkine in Tasmania. And um, if you, I urge you to visit Sarah's website because there's plenty of examples of really beautiful slime molds there. And um, these are taken in um, forests which are um, marked for, for clear felling. So hopefully we can protect them. Okay, WordPress. So let's get into uh, what WordPress is. So WordPress started as a blog engine uh, um, and then it's evolved to what we call content management system. So content management system is what it sounds like is a, is a software that allows you to manage content. So in the old days, if we had a three page website, we had a menu, page one, page two, page three. If we wanted to add another page, we'd have to then manually go and edit the menu to add the extra page. If we wanted to make a change to the header, then we'd have to manually make the change to the four pages. So what a content management system allows you to do is if you add a page, it will automatically uh, update all the navigation and all that stuff. That, that sort of seems um, just normal now, but um, that's, uh, it wasn't back in the past. Now, what WordPress now has become in 2020 is what I call Swiss Army Knife in the fact that it does heaps of things. You can plug in a booking calendar, you can plug in a e-commerce system, you can have a members only area, you can have a, a location finder, you can have a map. Um, it, it can do so many things. Um, I'd argue it's probably one of the most versatile platforms on the internet. Um, and so it can do lots and lots of things. The other key point about WordPress is that it's open source. And for those of you who have not um, become across open source, basically that means that the code is free. It's free as in free beer, uh, i.e. you don't need to pay for it, but also freedom, that you're free to do what you want with it. So if you decide that you can do WordPress better, you can grab the entire code base legally, move it to your own um, server, and then start developing it in your own way. The only restriction you have is that then you need to release that source code um, in the same way. So that means that um, a lot of people can do what they want with it. And so that's really allowed it to grow. Versus a lot of software, it's locked in and then you can't actually change it all or do too much to it. Uh, it's controlled by somebody else. It also means the business model. So if Word, the people that own WordPress, if they start being dodgy, then you can just take it along and do it, do it better. Uh, whereas if, if the software is um, closed source and they're starting being dodgy, then you've got two choices, one to leave or to put up with it. Um, now Automatic is the company that originally released it. And um, so back in the day, the around 2005, the business model was that if you're a web development company, that you'd develop your own CMS and you develop that code. And then when someone wanted to buy a website, you'd charge them to build a website from scratch, but you'd already have your CMS. So, you know, you'd charge someone 50 grand, 100 grand to build a website, which would include developing the code that, that run it. Um, so that's a standard business model that a lot of web development companies was using. So then um, there's a few systems coming out uh, in, in an open source format. Um, and so Automatic was one of these companies and then they released their platform open source and the rest is history. It's become the biggest platform. Uh, Automatic still own the copyright of the brand WordPress, 
Uh, however, the code is licensed open source, so you can take it and do what you want with it. But what they do is they're more now of a, a custodian of the code and they manage the, and they have some, they pay developers as well as volunteer developers to run it. And here's some of the other things. So the way they make their money is um, in WordPress.com, there's, um, we'll talk about that in a bit, there's various um, upgrades that you can pay for. WooCommerce has various upgrades you can pay for. Jetpack has various upgrades you can pay for, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got various um, business models that come in off WordPress. However, the core WordPress is free and will always be free. We also have um, a huge community that's, um, developing in WordPress. So if we, this is the wordpress.org site. So if you just go to get involved and there's a whole team of people around the world that are working on WordPress to make it more secure, to make it better, uh, all those things. So that's just a little bit of a background about what WordPress is. Now, before I go uh, more into, is it right for you or not? There's some really key concepts that, um, I would like you to understand before we start talking the pros and cons of different systems. The first one is technology minimalism. And so another way of thinking of that is keep it simple, stupid. You may have heard of keep it simple, stupid. Now I use a different analogy and that is keep it simple, smart ass. The reason I don't use the word stupid is because generally the people that are making things complex are far from stupid. In fact, they're very smart. They're that smart that they're able to, to do more complex things and they get excited and then they're doing more complex things. And then it gets to the point where they're doing comp complex things just for the point, just because of the point of it. Um, so in that context, I'd say they're being a smart ass. They're definitely not being stupid. So keep it simple. Just because you can make something fancy and can do this and that, uh, that doesn't mean that you should. And there's a few ramifications for complexity. Um, managing complexity, conflicts with complexity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another key concept is uh, a business model for software, which is called software as a service. Now this means that you'll hire, or you may get it for free, some software. And then the company is managing all your hosting, all the tech, all the security, all the, all the credit card linking up, everything. So, and we went through um, yesterday's webinar on website tech. Um, so we're talking about all the complexities of setting up websites and managing and hosting and things like that. So someone else is doing it for you. So an example is Facebook. So you go to Facebook, you create a Facebook page, and then you just start running your Facebook page. Facebook as the company manages all the tech for that. They do all the security. You don't have to worry about it. So that's a really key uh, concept um, that we'll, 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 I'll show some examples in a bit. The other um, concept is the opposite to software as a service is that if, if you're not paying that company to look after your tech, then you're responsible for it. You're responsible for the security patches. You're responsible for the, to pay for the hosting. You're, secure, you're responsible for it in an ongoing way. So when you're making decisions about your technology, you need to decide, do I actually want those technological um, responsibilities? Usually they're pretty minimal, but it will involve paying hosting and upgrading your software, for example. Um, and if you just don't want to borrow that, then software as a service would be more appropriate for you. Uh, key point is don't get distracted by graphic design. So I've spoken with a few people saying that, oh, I really like this platform better than another platform because it looks better. Now that's very deceiving because all the, most platforms, most website platforms, you can design anything in. So if you've got a really good graphic designer and you can code it, you can make it as pretty or as ugly as you want or you can. So in that context, the, the actual platform isn't, you can't judge a platform by how pretty it looks. Yes, you might say this specific template on this platform looks really good and I want to use that template on this platform. That's a fair enough way of looking at it but you don't want to say this platform's better than that platform because it looks better, because it can look anything. Um, so that's something that I come across um, both as a designer and as a developer, and it's, it's simply um, a, a real misconception. Um, and I've used it, I've seen it being used, um, you know, Squarespace is better than WordPress because it looks better. Um, that's simply not comparing. I mean, both of those websites can look really good and both can look really ugly. Uh, and the freemium business model is also important to talk about. 
so freemium business model and there's a spectrum on this so freemium business model is where a, a company gives a free service uh, and then they'll charge for upgrades so you would have seen this it's a normal thing in software so there's a spectrum so on one end of the spectrum is um, so like Yoast SEO tools that I went through in the SEO marketing it's a really good plugin that's free and it does heaps of stuff and it's a great plugin then if you want the advanced stuff you pay for it or WordPress if you want um, all the free like a lot of free stuff and then you pay for the good stuff now on the other end of the scale is where it's it's free and you pay for upgrades but the software doesn't really work without the upgrades or it just is, is a very bad experience. So then you're sort of forced to pay for the upgrades, at which point it's not really freemium, you need to pay for it up front. So when you're looking at freemium business models, have a look at what is actually free, what do you get, will it do what you need for free, or is it paid, um, and you may choose to pay for that. So yeah, have a look, there is a big spectrum between um, really good value free stuff and then you pay for good stuff, or it's, it just doesn't work without paying. WordPress comes in two flavors. And the reason I wanted to um, introduce those two concepts is that we have wordpress.com. Now wordpress.com is software as a service. This means that WordPress manages your hosting, it manages your security, it manages all the upgrades. You don't have to worry about it. You just go in there, create an account, and then run your website. It is Technically the same um, software is the other approach, which is wordpress.org. Now wordpress.org here, this is the community wordpress.org. So with this software, you have to actually download it or install it onto your server. So you'll need to have a host and then you'll need to um, get that installed. Then you need to be responsible for the upgrades and continuing managing those upgrades. So there's pros and cons to both approaches. Now the, the WordPress.com, which is uh, managed for you, you need to, um, it, it's a basic service. So there are fees attached if you want upgrades. So if you wanna use your own domain, for example, it'll cost some money. And if you wanna add this, it'll, it'll cost some money. And if you wanna edit the themes, it'll cost a bit more money. Um, it's still a comparable price. Uh, however, the, it will, uh, matter with this it's completely free however you're then paying for hosting and other costs so um, if you are just playing and you're starting to you know you're not sure what you want to do wordpress.com may work for you because you can transfer your content reasonably easy between the two platforms um, wordpress.com also if you're worried about about being attacked or hacked then WordPress.com, they're managing your security. If you're worried that you're gonna be really popular and you're, you're gonna get a huge traffic spike, then WordPress.com will handle that. So there's a, some good, good reasons to use it. Now the reason, um, and so from, from here on in this webinar, I'll only be talking about WordPress.org. And the reason I'm only talking about WordPress.org is because WordPress.com is very restrictive. It restricts what plugins you can put in, it restricts what themes you put in. The reason that is, is because they need to secure it. So they restrict the code to what code they can order and what code they can manage. Whereas in this context, you can do what you want. Um, so they don't care what you do. Um, so it's completely free and flexible. So yeah, as I said, as I'm moving forward, I'm only talking about WordPress.org. Now the software is exactly the same. The difference is, is that some, in this case, uh, WordPress is managing it for you. Okay. So WordPress, is it too much for you? So WordPress um, is starting to get a little bit more complex than it needs to. So software as a service may be appropriate for you. So I'm just gonna to jump to these website builders, which you may have heard, you may have heard of before. Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, there's a few of them. So if you wanna build a simple website, these, these websites are um, both software as a service, they are um, drag and drop interface, and they have really nice templates. Um, so Wix, um, and they have things like e-commerce plugging into them, Weebly um, and Squarespace. So this would be more appropriate if you just wanted a really simple site, um, you just wanted to put together 
where you go. Now these all have costs, yet Wix has a free version. Um, however, you will have to pay for upgrades. Now I don't know these systems in detail, so I can't tell you what upgrades and this and that. However, there will be um, fees in there somewhere. And I've heard, I heard good things about some of these um, platforms. There are also the issue is if you're then running um, e-commerce, for example, then there's a lot of hidden fees. Um, and I'll talk about that um, in the next one. So the, the other software as service could be specialist um, applications. So if you're running a Pacifica shop, you may choose one of these two platforms or there's plenty of them out there. This is purely a shop. Now the thing with the shop is that um, there are a lot of hidden, these sort of platforms as hidden costs. So for example, they'll charge you a monthly fee, but that's okay because usually it's the equivalent cost of hosting anyway. So that's generally just fits in. Um, however, they will also charge, I uh, know Shopify will charge a percentage on your transaction um, fee. So that may be only, uh, I think it's like one and a half percent, but then if you're paying two and a half percent or three and a half percent on your credit card, and then another one and a half, two percent on Shopify, it starts to add up. And then um, they, they have monthly add-ons. So then you, if you have an add-on here, an add-on there, and it's a monthly fee, the fees start to rack up. And although it's a dollar here, two dollars there, it does actually add up to be quite substantial. So in that context, you really want to check out what these things are costing you. Now it might be um, a temporary measure. You might say, oh, I'm going to test out an idea for a shop. I'm going to install it. Um, I'll just pay the fees, it'll be expensive, whatever. Oh, it's working now, so now I'm gonna build a proper one, for example. Um, now, if you wanted to be a blogger, then you may um, look at something like Medium because what Medium will help you do is actually get your content out there. So Medium is setting itself up as um, an actual place to go to get um, information. So that may be more appropriate than running your own WordPress blog, for example. Okay, so MailChimp is a newsletter, a CRM. Um, so now they're offering free websites. So if you're just doing a simple website that's based on a newsletter, this may be appropriate for you. Um, and the tools are different um, complexities and fees and all that stuff. So you need to dive in on that. Um, Nation Builder if you're, is a famous CRM for not-for-profits. Um, I think their websites are awful. However, they, they do come as a complete embedded package. Um, and they do provide a website. And if you're using the Nation Builder database, it makes sense to use the Nation Builder website. Um, and this one here is for folios for graphic designers or, or creatives. And so as well as um, giving you a folio, it also is a way to showcase your work. So depending on what you're trying to do, um, it may be a, um, a better tool. Now you may want to also mix it up. You might say, well, I want to get the benefit of um, Behance Network, so I may have my folio on there, but then I still want my own website, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, before you're even thinking about WordPress, you might go, is there another solution that's just um, okay? Now I want to talk a, a, a little bit to the concept, um, and I'll just stop sharing the screen. This concept that I get from, um, from some developers. Um, is WordPress not good enough for you? Um, so WordPress does get some criticism and I want to talk through that as well. So by a developer, I mean a web, web developer, someone who can write code, um, build websites, build apps, that sort of stuff. So here's some of their, um, some of their criticism. They'll say, oh, it's, it's not best practice. Um, we can be using cleaner code or better approaches. And my response to that is, well, it depends on the specific use. And that argument usually makes sense if you're a high traffic uh, website that's very specific, or if you are got a $30,000, $100,000 budget for your website. Now the people I work with simply don't have those sort of budgets. And so yeah, it may be best practice to custom build something specific for your needs. That's also 30 grand that's not best practice to spend on a website when I've got a, a charity to run. Developers love custom building stuff. That's why they're um, developers. So in that case, they much, it's more attractive for them to build something from scratch than it is to just remix platforms. My background is that I, I learned to code and develop simply because I wanted the end goal. And now there's easier and better ways to get that end goal. So I'm like, I've stopped developing as in that context because I'm more interested in the end goal. I'd much rather spend a hundred bucks uh, and get the code happening 
and, and start running the campaign than spend 30 grand on a website. Because that 30 grand could be spent on content marketing and other ways of getting your message out there. Developers love complexity and they've got the skills. So for example, a developer might go, oh, this is a really simple tool. You can just, it'll only take you an hour to install it. Well, it's simple for them. For someone who has no skills, that is very complex. So and developers sometimes forget people's skill levels. So I, I'm really um, aiming at, at beginners. Um, so if you've never used software before, this type of software before, I'm talking to you. Um, generally developers forget that and they're, they're like, yeah, just install this, just install that. But then there's layers of skills and, and stuff that you need to be able to install stuff. The other issue that I have um, is if, if you custom build something, then it's dependent on that builder. So in WordPress, for example, if you, if you pay for a custom complex build, it's unlikely any other developers will want to, will want to maintain that because we don't know what quality the code is. We don't know what their approaches is. It's messy. Usually clients spend heaps of money on it and they don't really want to spend much changing it. And if you start developing in another developer's um, development, then something could go wrong and then it's going to take 20 hours to try to figure out how they've done it and then fix it. The client's not going to want to pay 20 hours. So in that context, um, who's going to manage the upgrades? Is your developer going to be around for the next two, three years? So if you're building really custom built specific solutions, you, you need a three year plan. Whereas if I'm installing a default WordPress with a default theme, um, you're not dependent on me. Um, you, you, you know, you, you can get tech support from the, the developers of the theme. WordPress is getting supported. Um, you, you're just not dependent on me. So I'm a big fan of removing dependencies um, unless you can justify the dependency and you've got a good reason why. And then you've got a plan to plan that dependency in the future. Developers can also be siloed in that context. If, they, if they're used to um, developing in a certain language or a certain way, they're really skeptical of other ways of doing it. So they, they might go, oh, well, the way WordPress does it is really bad because I'm used to doing it this way. So in that context, is the criticism justified? I don't think so. Most of the, the crit that I get back from developers is really, um, it's just a different case scenario. They're, they're talking best practice on high budget websites or very specific use cases. And in that case, they're completely right. WordPress is the wrong tool. However, for most small business, small NGOs, small use, um, I don't think that criticism applies. Uh, but he's saying that though, there are some cons of WordPress. WordPress does have some, some um, issues and I'm gonna go through them. Uh, one is that it's targeted. It's the largest platform on the planet. And so it gets targeted by, by hackers a lot. It's getting uh, targeted so much that I'm seeing now websites uh, it's getting that's affecting the performance. So these are websites that get they're getting far more traffic from attempted hackers than they are from actual people visiting the website. Uh, now the we've secured the website, so the hackers aren't getting in; they're just trying. Now what that does is it just overloads the server, and it costs more money to host it. It's just really um, quite annoying, and I call it hacking spam because it literally is just spam trying to get in there. Um, and also spam, so comment spam and other types of spam, it gets targeted. WordPress does require additional security. Uh, out of the box, WordPress claims that it's very secure. Um, however, I recommend that we install plugins and we tighten up that security. Um, back to the first point, there's so much hacking attacks. attacks. Uh, WordPress is coming, becoming a little bit more complex. It was more simpler uh, a few years ago. Um, however, you can still keep it simple, um, but there is, it's much easier to start making things complex and back to the keep it simple smart ass. We really want to try and keep things simple. Um, and this isn't a reflection of WordPress, but I'm seeing a lot of bad advice out there. People that don't really know what they're doing, um, don't know, uh, teaching people how to do things wrong. Um, you've got people who are naive to what they're doing, building really complex sites. Um, suppliers that are supplying commercial services that don't know what they're doing, um, plugins and themes that just aren't well written. So that's just more of a, a phenomenon of this, its size. So just be a little bit more discerning about who you're listening to and who's supplying 
and those sort of things. And when I when we do our webinar on plugins and themes, I'm going to go through to how to select themes and plugins to sort out the quality from the chaff. And um, WordPress can also be a bit what we call code bloated. That means there's code in there that we're not using. And so if we're downloading a page, for example, if we're not using all that code, it becomes code bloat. And also if we're using lots of plugins and different themes, then we can also get some conflicts. Now I think that, although I'm talking about the cons, I think all this is can be minimized and, and is minimal. And so um, I'm a big fan of WordPress. And so now I'm gonna to move to like, why would we use WordPress? Flexibility and control. So we, we can really flex, we can do what we want with it. We can control it um, and do what we want. We can also manage our costs. So in the context of if we've got the shopping software, then um, you can't control what the costs are. If you wanna have cheap hosting, then you can pay for less hosting. If you wanna have only use free plugins, then you can only use free plugins. So it's a bit easier to manage how much things cost. Whereas if you've got, um, say, one of the software as a service shopping platforms and you start doing more sales, then the cost goes up and then, you know, you can't really control that. Um, it can be scaled. Uh, no, the huge scale. So WordPress is a massive community. So that means there's heaps of um, like WordPress website to support you. There's heaps of support out there. There's heaps of suppliers. There's heaps of WordPress developers. There's heaps of companies that manage WordPress. So if you're working with a WordPress company and you're not happy with them, you can find another WordPress company easy enough. Um, so there's heaps of services um, and there's heaps, just heaps of applications on it. So the, the, there's so many different applications of WordPress because of the scale. It's also respected and used by some big players. Um, so some big media organizations are using it. Um, some big celebrities are using it. Some big respected scientific organizations, that sort of stuff. So there are some big players using it and some respected ones. It uses common languages. So by that is the languages that it's written in. PHP, MySQL, um, those sort of things. So that means that it's well supported. Those languages are common. They're all open source as well. So all the platforms that WordPress is built on is all open source. And so that means that when you're talking about hosting and management, it's a lot easier. Um, there's just massive amount of plugins and themes that adds functionality to WordPress. There's just, there's, there's the hundreds and thousands of plugins and themes. So that gives you a lot of choice. It also means if you're trying to do something specific, then there's more likely someone's got an application that will plug in rather than you having to then custom build something. Uh, it's got a really good templating language. So that's more if you wanted to build a custom theme or a custom look, then it's got a really good templating language. That was one of the reasons I started using it um, 10 years ago or however long I started using it because I will custom building the websites and we were using the WordPress templating language. It is cheap to build if you do it right. Um, you can do really expensive builds in WordPress, but you can also do really cheap builds. And I've, one of the things I've been focusing on is reducing the cost of build, because I'm a believer that you can then spend that money, you still have the same budgets, but you spend that money on content, and that helps your content marketing, and et cetera, et cetera. And there's other things you can spend money on rather than the build. Uh, WordPress can scale, so that means it can handle heavy traffic. Um, Generally, if you're on a large scale, then you'll need some sort of optimization on it, but generally it, it, it will scale. It's still reasonably simple if you keep it simple. Um, it has a lot of drag and drop plugins. So by that, I mean page builders. So if you're, you don't, this allows you to do page layouts and all that sort of stuff without having to use code. This is a recent thing. Um, Wix um, and Squarespace that I showed you recently. They've been doing it for a few years and it means it's really easy. You can go and drag and drop. Uh, WordPress plugins um, aren't as recent, but they're getting, they're, they're here now. Um, Divi, Elementor are two, uh, two famous ones. So that just means it's far easier now for non-technical people to build websites. And it makes a central, a really good central hub. 
So if you came to my um, strategy sessions, I talked a lot about having a website as a central hub where you've got your social media and your other websites and other assets that come into a central hub. Um, WordPress works really well because you can embed lots of things, you can configure lots of things, you can get it to talk a lot of, lot of things. That's if you want to build more of a complex network of um, digital marketing. Um, it works really good for that. Okay, any questions along the way? So now we're going to get into, into the actual WordPress itself. This now, now we're talking specifically about WordPress.org um, because WordPress.com is managed, but we're, we're going to assume that you're going to manage yourself. So the first thing is you need a host. And I talked about hosting in yesterday's basic website tech, so you can check that out. Um, but basically a host is where your website lives. So it's so a company that will um, that provides computer space that's plugged to the internet where you can hire, and that's where your website lives. So we assume that you've already got a host. Now some hosts will have WordPress pre-installed, so you don't have to do anything, it's already installed. That's quite common. Now it's also very common for web hosts to have what's called a one-click install. So you'll log into your web host panel, you click the install WordPress button and then WordPress magically installs and it's done. And then the third way, uh, and I'm not going to run it through uh, today because we've got a, lot, a bit to go through, um, but that's a manual installation. So this is if you're just, you're going to install it yourself. So to do that, you need to download WordPress from wordpress.org and then you upload it to your host um using ftp so we went through that in the in the um web tech and you uncompress that on the server so the, the wordpress files are now on your server then in your website admin you go in and create a database with the username password and you give it permissions then you just type in your web address and wordpress has a follow the prompt so you just put in the database details you put in your name username password and it installs so WordPress is really easy to install. So that's a, that's a, even that manual installation um, for maybe people new to tech, that may be a little complex. However, I've stopped showing people um, the manual install because most web hosts just have a button and you just click, click it. Okay, so we're going really, um, really fast. So um, the WordPress tour is a lot more, more detailed. So I'm going to jump into to that. So if you've got any questions, and I'll have a drink. Okay. Now, what I've done um, for this webinar is I've installed a technology called MAMP. And um, what this does is allows me to run a web server on my laptop. And I talked um, in the tech webinar how that's bad practice for public websites. Um, however, it means that I'm not on the internet. Um, now, generally, I will work on on the internet on a server if I'm building websites. That's because I'm usually working with other people and it's easier to have a website up where everyone can access it. Now, if you're working on a website by yourself, then it's far easier to work on your laptop because you don't have to worry about internet speeds. Now, in the case of running a Zoom webinar, uh, Zoom slows down my internet connection and so that means everything's slower. So then I decided to install this on, on MAP and, and get going. Um, and there's also one for Windows. This is free software. It's a freemium business model. And um, you'll need to manually install the WordPress. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to have a play, then you could do that. Okay, so this is, uh, and you'll see the URL up the top. Um, oh, actually, I'm not sharing screen. Let me share screen. Um, so this is the MAMP. Um, so just search for um, MAMP. Or if you're on Windows, it's called WAMP. Uh, okay. So this is WordPress out of the box. I just installed this yesterday, but I did, I haven't touched anything else. So this is what it looks like. And you know, it looks pretty ugly out of the box. So it's gonna need, need some, some work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna log in. Now you can log in a few ways um, to the site admin. So when it first comes out, you've got this button here and this will click to, to admin. Now, I usually take those buttons out. So in which case, I will usually just type up at the top here, wp-admin, and that gets me in as well. And then you'll need to log in. I'm already logged in. So now with WordPress, we have what we call a front end and a back end. So by front end, 
what we mean is what people see. It's the public public party website. This this is the front end, and the back end, uh, or dashboard, um, or admin is the back of the website where we're doing the bits and pieces and we're we're setting up the website. So the the uh, audience doesn't see this part of it. Okay, so I'm just going to run you through all the bits. Um, and I'm going to pull that out onto here so I can follow it. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to, to go through is um, come down to here to settings. I'm going to run through all the settings and explain what they mean. Okay, so site title. This this is really this is important. So Glenn's website. Um, obviously, you put your brand or whatever. Now tagline. This depends on your theme that you choose, uh, whether this displays or not. And most themes don't display it. So a lot of people just just don't update this. Now, unfortunately, what happens is other applications this may appear. So you may um, post it to Facebook, for example, and then this may appear and it just looks really lame, just another WordPress site. So put your tagline in there. If you don't have a tagline and you really, really have nothing to put there, just put your website address. It'll look far better if it says Glenn's website, Glenn's website twice than it will be Glenn's website, just another WordPress blog. Um, okay, so put something in there. Now this is the web, the address of your website and this is a little bit different because I'm using map. The administration email, that should make sense. Membership, anyone can register. So unless you've got good reason for people to register on your website, then don't switch it on. Generally, if you're having some sort of membership, you're more likely to need a, some sort of plugin um, to help make, you know, to give you more functionality. Um, keep this to subscriber. I'll go through user roles later. Now site language. So I've set this to Australia, so that means I can spell color correctly and a few other um, phrases. Or you could have English, um, United States or UK. Now time zone. There's two ways of setting the time zone. You can use the UTHC. However, what I recommend though, is that you don't set it to that. You actually set it to your, your, um, your local um, city. So if I can find Melbourne here somewhere. Asia, Australia, here we go, Melbourne. The reason we want to set it to Melbourne, not to the UTC, is because daylight saving. This will actually change the, um, the time of the website. Now, it is important to have the right time because uh, it, it, it's displayed at certain times. So if you do a blog post, it will have the time on it. Or if someone's made some edits to the website and you're trying to work out who did it and when, it's good to have the correct time so you can track that down. Date format, again, mostly it's the theme that will display that. So this setting may, may not work, but you can fiddle with that. Uh, we start, so we save that. Okay, writing. There's not much here that we will look at. Now what post by email allows you to do is to post to your WordPress blog by email. So just say that you're a sports blogger and you're at the local marathon um, post COVID and you wanted to do an update of the race. So what you could do is you could email the address, um, login at example.com. And then you would, so you'd use a proper email there. And then you would send an email to that. And the title of the email would be the title of the blog post. The email body would be the body of the blog post. Any attached pictures would be made into an image gallery. Um, so that's a, that could be a really powerful tool if, if you've got a good case scenario for it. Um, I've never used it, but that's what it's for. Um, okay, so when I talk about blog posts later, they come, there's lots of different design um, tweaks. Some themes support design tweaks. So if your blog post is a link or a quote, so it's best just to keep that standard. Now default um, post category, I'll talk about categories a bit later and we'll come back to that. Okay, now reading's got some um, important um, settings here. I'm just gonna jump down to this bottom one here. Discourage search engines from indexing your site. 
Now, at the moment, I don't, well, search engines can't find my site because it's on my laptop. But if I'm running a development site, I don't want Google to, to index it. Now, if I'm a live site, I need Google to index it. So it's really important when you put a website live or even if you've got a website, come in and check that because it should be unticked. If you want Google to find your website, you should untick that. That's a very important one. Okay, so by default, WordPress displays the blog. Now, most websites don't want the blog on the homepage. So what we can do is we can go page, a new, and then I'm going to call it home. And I'm going to publish that. Publish. It's now live. Actually, and I'm going to write um, welcome. My bad spelling. Update. Now I'm going to come back to my settings and reload it. And then I'm going to, at the moment, it's saying my home page displays latest posts. So I'm going to turn that to static. And now I'm going to select home. And then my home page will become, so see how it's got the blog now? Now I reload this and then it becomes my page. So that's you, most websites will, um, you do probably want a home page, not the blog. So that's how you set that. And if you want a blogs page, um, then you can actually, you could create a page that says blog or news or whatever you'd like to call it. And then you can select it here. And then, um, that will then display the blog page, which was on the home page. Now on your blog page, how many posts will display? Well, this will control that. And again, themes sometimes will override this. So there may be two places where there's settings for things like this. Discussion. Okay, so this is comments. Now comments on WordPress is, I don't think is a good idea, unless you've got a good case scenario. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Um, in modern, um, in 2020, most conversations are on social media and you're more likely to pull your conversations over to social media. So it makes less sense to um, be using comments. Now comments um, also get heavily, heavily spammed. So if you want to use comments, then you'll need to, you need to configure a plugin, which is, is in the plugins. We'll go through your plugins in a little bit. But this ASCII met, you'll need to set up ASCII met if you want to use um, if you want to use comments, because um, if you don't install ASCII met, you'll get spammed heavily. If you have now comments can be useful on a specific page, for example, you might be create, you might be compiling a list of resources, and you might say, you know, can you comment if you've got more resources? Um, search engines do like comments on um, pages. But generally, they're just so much pain, they're so painful to manage because of the spam. So in this case, to turn them off, I'm going to go allow people to submit comments. Now, attempt to notify any blogs linked to from the post. Now, if another WordPress website um, puts, your, puts a, your web address on their blog post, it will ping well, page, it will, it will ping a comment, and then there'll be a comment on your blog that said, this other blog has actually linked to you. So we wanna switch that off as well. Now, the rest of the settings down here only, only apply if you've got these three boxes ticked. So we're just gonna ignore these because we've got the comments switched off. Now, I think it's really important that you go in and switch comments off the first thing you do, that you do. Um, you can switch them on later. You can also switch comments on and off per page. Now the problem is that this setting is only for new posts and new pages. So if you've got 20 pages that have already got comments on, this doesn't switch it off. This only switches off future comments. So you'll need to go to each page and switch them off, or you can install a plugin that will allow you to switch them all off. Okay, so we'll discuss media in a bit and I'll come back to this setting. Now, permalinks um, is, is quite an important um, setting to use. So plain, this is the default way that uh, WordPress, specifically PHP, makes your um, web addresses. That's pretty boring. 
So what we'd prefer to do is use a word. So if I called my um, page Glenn's WordPress training, then the URL will be Glenn slash WordPress slash training. So this is what we want here. And then we can set that. Now, these ones up here are for formatting your blog. So if you're producing one blog post a month, then I recommend that you don't need any dates unless it's date specific of what you're doing. So, but if you're, if you're producing like four blog posts a day, then you may want to put the month or you may want to put the day. So the, the dates can be useful, but think about if you actually need those dates then. Um, but generally I set mine to just sample post, which is just simply the, um, the URL there. And then I hit save. And then we'll go to privacy. Now privacy, this functionality was set up post um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal and all the privacy laws then being brought out in Europe. Now it doesn't really do much. It just more is prompting you to have a privacy policy. Um, so by default, it will install um, a privacy policy page, but there's nothing on that really. So let's just go to, to pages and have a look at the privacy policy. So it's draft and let's see what it says. Yeah, here we are, the data we collect. So not really much, but it's a good pro forma to start. And I do recommend that you do um, take your privacy seriously. So they're the basic settings that we want to get started with, with WordPress. Do we have any, any questions there? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, okay, so I'm going to now talk about posts and pages. The difference between posts and pages. So I'm going to start with pages. Now what a page is, is it's um, a web page. Um, sort of sounds makes sense. But for example, a contact page, that sort of thing. Now the difference between a page and a post, uh, let me just go add new page and we'll have a look. And I'll go add new post and we'll have a look about the difference. Now, um, you'll see on this side here, we've got categories, tags. And on this one, we don't have those. So the difference between a blog post and a page is that they can be categorized. They have archives. So that means they're a lot more dynamic. So they can have archives on categories, tags, author, and date. So to a normal blog that you'd see, a traditional blog, would be the latest, that'd be um, an archive of blog posts and the latest one is at the top. So they're usually by date order. So with WordPress, you can, um, you can click on the category and then just see all the blog posts from certain categories or from authors and all that sort of stuff. So this is designed to be a blog, but you can use it slightly differently. Um, for example, if you're a graphic designer, you could have a new post, but then it's actually a, um, it's a, um, a portfolio item so you might go my my graphic design and then you could categorize it this is print this is web design this is this is some other design so you can use it differently to to a blog if you'd like now if you wanted to do that or use it differently than a blog then we can come back to our settings here and back to our permalinks and we come down to here and it says category base and tag base so um, if you, uh, let's just do that. Let's add a, let's add a, um, let's add a category, um, add a new category. So I'm going to call it um, design. And I'm going to do, um, this is my graphics page. Publish, publish. Done. Now I'm going to view the post. Okay, so oh, it didn't, didn't categorize. Hang on, let me go back and category name. Okay, so what happened is I didn't add the actual button. There we go. So now it's categorized design, update, graphic design. Okay, now it's in the design category. So if I can click design, and there's all the blog posts which are graphic design. Now at the top here, if we look at our URL, 
So this is my website URL. It looks a bit different because of map, but usually that will be www.mywebsite.com. This category, if you are using categories as categories, that makes sense. But in this case, we want to use it as a portfolio. So what we can do is we can jump back to our permalinks at the category base. We're going to change that to um, portfolio. We'll save that. Now when I reload my design and I go to design, now I see how the URL has changed the portfolio to design. So you can use blog posts as not blog as other things to blog posts. Okay. Um, so let's go back to adding a page. So I'm going to just start that again. Um, so I've gone now to pages. Um, so if I click on pages, if we look at this screen, this is all the pages of our website. So generally pages are what we call undynamic content. So that might be the home page, the about page, contact page, um, and versus the dynamic content, which would be your blog posts, which can be in date order and that sort of stuff. Up the top here, we've got the published ones and the draft ones. And here's, so to get to the um, controls, we roll over it. So we can edit it, which will go into full edit mode. Or we can go to quick edit, and this can just do some quick, quick touches. Um, cancel. Or I can move it to the trash. And then up here, see we've got a trash up the top. So now we can go in there and it's in the trash, and we can empty the trash. The other thing that we can also do is we might want to do changes to all the pages. So we, we select the ones that we want to change and then we go edit or move to trash, uh, apply. And in this case, we may change the author, the template, uh, a few other things. Okay, so I'm going to cancel that. All right, so I'm going to go in and edit this, this page now. Okay, so this is, um, a new uh, thing in WordPress called the block editor uh, uh, from the classic editor. And we'll install a plugin in a little bit later and we'll show you how the classic editor works. And I prefer to use the classic editor. That's just because I'm used to it. Um, I'm not really a fan of this block editor. Uh, and also I'm using the Divi editor, which is a different approach again. Um, I just find it very clunky. Now I do see that in the future that this will this will merge into a drag and a drop interface. But let me just show you um, a bit of a tour of this at the moment. So the first thing we do is we this is our title. So this is really important for search engine optimization, not on the home page, but on any other page. So I'm going to call it um, what's the home page. So from there you can start typing. And the way, if, if you think about every paragraph and every bulleted list and heading is now a block. So in that context, if I just do this, what it's doing, if I roll over it, that's now created a paragraph block. Or I may roll over it. Actually, if I let me do that and see the positive, if I click off it, see how it's got a little positive sign? So we click on that. I hit the positive sign. This allows me to use other blocks. So for example, we've got paragraph, but you may insert an image, gallery, list, quote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they're the standard standard things. Uh, you may want to put a, a YouTube video, et cetera. Formatting, you can put the classic editor in there if you want to use the, the classic editor. So let me just see what that looks like. So there you go, you've got just a normal editor like you would, uh, that is the old way of doing it. You um, may look at layout elements. So this allows you to use columns. Now this is, is quite exciting because uh, columns in WordPress used to be painful. Um, so it allows you to do columns and most of the layouts. Um, and also, uh, we'll go through widgets in a little bit and embeds. So you can embed all sorts of stuff. You, you could embed your Facebook profile. You can embed, you, you'll need to play with these sort of things. 
So I'm just going to do a quick overview of this. Um, so on the on the top here is at an add block. So this was the same way of where I was approaching it before. So you could just go add block. That's the same interface that we we're doing before. This is undo. This is move forward. This shows you um, in a hierarchical uh, manner what blocks you have. And this allows you to select blocks so you can edit them that way. So it's a different way to access that. Okay, so at the top here, um, now I've published this live so we can switch it back to draft. This is the update button, so I, that makes sense. If I click preview, it will open, in, open it up and then show what it looks like. And it opens in a new tab. Now I recommend that you have two tabs open when editing WordPress pages because then you can hit update. While that's thinking about it, you can come and hit refresh. It's a lot faster way of working. Okay, so I'm going to now, okay, so this bit here, this removes that side thing. So that way you can um, have a full view for when you're editing your, web page, your WordPress pages. This has a few options. And I'm going to just show you this one because in previous um, webinars, I've talked about accessing the HTML code. Okay, I won't go through that now, but this is where your HTML code is. Um, and these comments are a bit ugly and that's one reason I'm not liking these blocks. I'm going to move back to the visual editor. Um, we've also got a few sets here. We can um, manage what blocks, if there's certain blocks you're never using, you can switch them off, that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm going to click on the document tab here. And this is the all the things um, that are related to the document versus if I click on here, this will show the settings for the block. Okay, so let's start with the with the document and I'll go through the settings here. Status and visibility. So this means it's public. So there's a few options here. Public means anyone can see it, of course. Private, that means that you need to be logged into WordPress to see it. So you might have um, a members only area or you may be working on a, on a page and you're not ready for people to see it, but you want your, your colleagues to see it, so then you can have that. Password protected means that you need a password to view that page. Now this is um, useful for some ways, but not in others. So for example, if it's password protected, that means it's one password for all the people. So that means you distribute the password, so then it can get spread and people can, can get in there. So if you actually do want members only content, then you should set up a members only area content, set it to private. So then people need a username and password to get in there. But this could be useful. For example, is say you're doing um, a collaboration with the local Aboriginal group and you've done the copy, but you want them to, to check it to make sure that it, they're happy with it before it goes live. So you can password protect it, send them a password. And that just means it's easy for them to log in. They don't need a username and password that sort of stuff. So that can be quite useful um, just for simple case scenarios. Publish date. This allows you to backdate. So just say that your, your blog post was um, about something that happened last Thursday, but you've only just caught up and you're able to publish it today. You can backdate it and put whatever date you want. Now you can also put a future date. Now if you put a future date and you set it to um, public, it will publish it on that day. So this allows you to schedule posts. So if you're going to um, say a protest or a conference, you may have pages already um, built, um, scheduled to go at a certain time. You may already have uh, Twitter posts ready to schedule to say, check out this page. It's all automated, ready to go. Um, so that's how you um, schedule in WordPress. Revisions is really useful um, and this will only appear if you've got, if you've made changes to your page, so a new page won't have these. So if I click to here, and this will show the different versions. So I haven't really done much, um, but so we've got three versions here. And so this is showing me the, ch the changes. This is really good because um, obviously if you make mistakes or another thing that's really good is it shows who's, who's done it. So just say you've done a really good page then your colleagues come in and um, made changes that are actually not very good. You actually know what time they made the changes, who made the changes, and you can also roll back and override their changes. So this is a useful tool, um, uh, the revisions. 
permalink. So this is the, uh, the actual page or the, the link of the page. So if you've got a really long page title, so it may be um, the basics of WordPress introduction, but you may just want the URL to be WordPress intro. So you can um, actually edit that here. Oh, can I edit it? Oh, I have to, yeah, I have to come back to figure out how to do that. Oh, I know where that is, that's in the slug. Okay, so featured image. This image is, um, if it's a blog post, do you know how blog posts appear uh, and I've got the thumbnail and then a summary and you click through for the post? That's what the featured image is. Some themes will display the featured image at the top of the page. And another important point, if you're not using featured images, is to add a featured image any, to important pages. Because if you post this to um, Facebook, then that will also grab that featured image and post that in Facebook. Discussion, this is the, um, so to set featured image, you just um, grab an image and away we go. Um, discussion, this, this is allowing comments. So I've switched comments off um, in the settings earlier and this will allow you to switch it off. Page attributes. Some templates or some themes have different templates. So they may have a, a specific template for the home page. So you could choose the home page template if it was the home page. Uh, in this context, we've got um, a full width template, which means it will take away the sidebar. So this is something that's a bit more dependent on the theme. And so the theme may give you some extra templates there to use. Okay, so the parent page. So this is um, interesting. What a parent page will do is if I set um, this as my parent page, which doesn't make sense as my home page, then it will change. If I update that, that's updating. Okay, sample page. Ah, because I've set it as a home page. So I'll show you that example on a new page. Actually, let me do that. Um, page, add new. Publish that, publish. Okay, that's cool. So we come down here and I'm gonna set it to sample page and update. So see now my, um, my permalink has changed to sample page test. So what you do is if you, you set a, child, a page as a child, then it gets the parent's URL. So there's some good case scenarios for that. Just, just say that you have about and then you have team. So you want the actual URL to read my, my website address forward slash about forward slash team. Generally, I try to just keep URLs as short as possible. So I, I don't use page, um, the parent pages very often. It's pretty rare I use them. But there are sometimes good case scenarios to use that. And that's what that does there. Um, okay. Ah, okay. So that's interesting because I, um, when I said here's where you edit the permalink, it wouldn't let me edit it because of it was the home page. So see how we've got here. Um, forward slash test. So I might want to call my page um, test this wonderful page and update that. Now see how my, my URL is still test. So then I might want to change that to test page and I update that. And then my URL becomes the test page. So I can view that page There we go. So see, this is the long title, but here, this is the actual URL up there. I showed you the document view, so I forgot to show you the blocks. I'll show you that now. So I'm choosing um, a paragraph. So this is my paragraph. Maybe I prefer to have a bulleted list. So maybe I'll choose a list like so. Okay, so over here now in the um, 
block section, which the before we in the document tab, went through those settings, now we're in the block. So this is the setting specifically for this block. So what have we got here? So there's not really any settings there. Okay, so let's jump to something else. Okay, so paragraph does have settings. So we can choose different sizes and we can choose some colors, etc. cetera. Um, we've also got some options up here. We can align it, um, bold, italics. This is a link, so we can add a link. Um, and I'll add my link. Okay. Oh. Now all the different blocks all have their own settings. So um, if we had a gallery, for example, um, so that doesn't have any settings either. Um, however, various um, blocks will have various settings. So uh, when you're in here, make sure you don't get confused between block and document. Documents for the whole page blocks for the Pacific block unit. All right, so I'm just going to jump out of there. Um, and I'm going to now jump to a post. So as I mentioned before, a post and a page are very similar. Uh, however, a post has archives. Test post. And then if I click on my sidebar and I go to document, We've got all the same um, things, the visibility, the publish date. However, we've got this, what we call sticky. So if, you, if you've got a blog, uh, blog post archive, so your homepage of your blog, and then you've got the latest blogs first, you can stick one blog post to the top. So this might be an introduction or a really important blog post, but it's always sits at the top. Um, so we've got categories that I discussed earlier, and then tags. And so that's really the key difference. Uh, there's not a lot of difference between them. Uh, and it also has an archive, uh, sorry, an author archive. However, that's linked to me because I'm logged in. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, I'll go through plugins in a little bit, but I'm just going to show you how to turn on Classic Editor. So I'm going to plugins, add new plugin. And you'll see right here is the Classic Editor on the right here. Um, and so I'm going to hit install. Now that's installed, I'm going to activate it. This plugin has no settings. It's simply on or it's off. So now if I go to pages, add new, we've got a quite a different layout here, but it's the same, same but different. Um, it's got all the same things. So your title is the same as the title before my test page. Now I prefer this layout myself. So here we go, we've got save draft. There's the, there's the status of, um, we publish it. There's the visibility, there's the date. Here's the parent attributes that I went through, the featured image. So it's all here, it's just in a little bit of a different format. Also, um, have a look up here. We've got screen options. And this is across a lot of, um, Word, across a lot of WordPress pages. And sometimes things are hidden. So for example, we've got the discussion and the comments um, hidden and we've got the author hidden. So if I switch them back on, if we come down here, we've got the comments sections and we've got the author, which is me. So if you're in a WordPress interface and you, you think, oh, am I going crazy? I've, I'm sure that thing was meant to be there. Glenn was showing me or I saw it earlier. Then just uh, come up to here, click on your screen options and just make sure it's ticked. Um, because, for example, revisions uh, in earlier versions was switched off and that was um, really confusing. Um, there's also a help screen. So if you're a bit confused, you've, you've also got help up. that's up on this right hand screen. Um, and this is just a normal editor, like a bit like Word, for example, does the thing. There's your HTML view. Um, so, and with a post is exactly the same as well. You can go add new post and you've got your editor there. So it depends on, on what um, approach you prefer with your editing. I prefer this approach. I find it a lot cleaner and easier. Uh, and I think 
that's because blogs, uh, the block system is in early days. And I think the block system is going to get better and it's going to start doing really interesting things. And then at that point, um, it will be very interesting to see how it evolves. Uh, at the moment, I think it's, a, it's starting off as a strong framework, but I, I personally don't like using it. Um, but yeah, if you really like using it, then um, sure, go ahead. Okay, so in underneath posts, we can go um, click on categories and we'll leave. And here's where all the categories are for the, for the categories. So in this context, there's the one, the design, the one that I made earlier, and there's one blog post that's attached to that. So I can create a new one. So I might go um, training and then just add new category and it will automatically make training and then it's made the URL or the slug training. So I might go, I actually don't want it to be called um, I want to change it so I can hit edit and then I might call it um, WordPress training and I may adjust the, the slug just to be WP for example. So this is where you can override and control um, your categories and you also have a parent um, category there as well and that works exactly the same way as the the page, the, the page attributes parent function that we showed earlier. Uh, now categories and tags are same but different. And by that I mean uh, categories um, are des uh, described as hierarchical and tags are non-hierarchical. Now that's not, um, so that's just in a WordPress context. Add new. So you see here categories all the existing categories appear, um, so you can just tick them. Whereas tags, you need to type them in. So test tag, add. So I much prefer um, using categories. So if you've got complex needs, you may have used both categories and tags, but generally, if you've just got simple needs and you really want to just use categories or tags. And because categories are a lot easier for, for the user, you can just see what your categories are and tick them. I prefer to use categories in that context and authors doesn't have an interface where you access so let me jump to a post so see we've got the title and then it's by glenn so that i'm the author and we've got the date so here the other um archives so if i click on glenn it will show all the blog posts by glenn so if i've got multiple ones i'll show those and by date this will go by date so I'll show all the blog posts that are um that are on that date. So that's the um, archives, the categories, the tags, and the authors. Um, okay, see you, Paula. Just looking at the um, comments. All right. Um, now I'm going to talk about the media library, which is here. So the media library is where we add all of our photos and our PDFs and our PNGs that sort of stuff. So let me see if I've got any images and no, I don't have any images. Um, let me grab, let me grab Flappy. So in that case, I've got um, a folder here so I can just, will that let me drag and drop straight to here? So you can just drag straight onto that and now upload the image just like that. So I, I tend not to use this in this way of using the media library. I'm going to, I'll, I'll show you another way of doing it. Or you could go add here and then you can select files and go through the, um, the filing structure that you know, you're used to. Okay. So the way we usually uh, access that the um, media library is when we're editing a page or a post, we can just click add media here. And this will, this will add us to the, the same spot. Um, so we can then select our files uh, or we can just drag straight onto here. So um, so this is the WordPress fundamentals uh, that we're looking at right now. This is the back end of my Action Schools website. So I'm going to go to the media library. Now I don't have a lot on, in my media library, but it'll be a bit better example um, than what I've got there. So this is all the pictures that I've got in my library, which isn't many. And I can click here and I'll list them as a list 
they'll give me a lot more information. So depending on how you want to view that. So this one's interesting because it's got the um, a bit more information about it. Now with your media library, I'll jump back to settings. Um, so back to where I was in settings, I skipped this because I wanted to introduce the media library first. When you upload an image to WordPress, if it's larger than 1024 pixels, so just say it's 1200 pixels, you will keep your original, then it'll make a large size, it'll make a medium size and a thumbnail size. And that's useful because somewhere in your theme, it makes sense to do a, put a small image rather than the big image to make your website faster. So these are the default crops and the way that it will automate your crop. Uh, it'll keep the same, with the thumbnail, it'll actually cut it into a square, but with medium, it'll either use the, the if your image is portrait, then it'll be 300 high, if it's landscape, it'll be 300 width. So you may wanna change these um, dimensions. You may have a, a previous theme that you've used and you wanna make the, the new theme fit that. Um, generally themes will may add different um, sizes. Um, so yeah, you can, you can adjust the size that WordPress will make your images as you upload them. Now this only applies to future ones. So there, is, there are plugins which will allow you to um, reprocess your images if you change this setting. Um, and so that's the media library. So I will sh also show you the gallery. Um, so I'm gonna go add new. This will be a little bit slower because it's um, running straight off the internet. And, uh, and I'm gonna add media. So now I'm going to create a gallery. So I create a gallery. So that means I'm, um, I'll show you what that means. So I'm gonna grab these three images and uh, create a gallery. Now I could caption them if I want. Now, if I click on this, this one image here, there's some settings that I may want to um, play with. Per image. Now at the top here is the actual um, gallery settings. So in this case, I want to I want to um, click to the actual media file, the actual image itself. Now what an attachment page is, is if you upload an image to WordPress, it creates a page for it. Now there's usually not much use for that. Um, if you're selling advertising, so you're, maybe you'll see some um, clickbait on Facebook and you click it and then every image that may be in an image gallery reloads a new page so it can feed more ads. Um, but generally attachment pages are, are useless. I mean, sometimes they're useful. But, so I just want to go straight to the image. So I'm going to do that. We want three columns. And here, here's those image sizes that we were discussing previously. So do, do I want to actually have it as the medium size display. And then I'm going to insert gallery. So there's my gallery there. And if I publish that. Okay, so while we're waiting for that to load, I also show you another thing that's important for when you are inserting an image. If you, um, so I'm going to add media. Oh, and I, so here we can upload and this tab here is the media library where I was before. So I'm going to click on this. Now on the right hand side, see it says alt text. Now this is really important to put this something in there. This is the text that displays when the image doesn't load. So that's really important for people with disabilities. It's important for people who don't like uh, sight disabilities, so go screen reader. Uh, it's important for people who have images switched off and a lot of people do have images switched off or if there's an error with the image and the image doesn't load, um, or if um, Google Voice is looking at your website. So I'm gonna put um, sculpture. And it's also really good for search engines. So I'm gonna put sculpture there. Um, the title is similar, but the old text is far more important. Now, um, a caption, some themes support that or not. That is actual text that you see under the, under the image. So that's reviewed. The old text won't, won't be seen. Now description is if you want long form alt text. So this is more for screen readers or again, if uh, Google Voice is reading out the web page for you. 
Um, okay, so here we can add a link to the image, media file or URL. So I might want to click on this image and then link to another website. So my website.com. And now the size is important because at the moment this wants to put in the smaller size of my um, page as of my image. So it wants to insert a small version of it, but I want the full size version of it. So I'm going to click that and then insert into page. And there's my image that's inserted. And then if I jump to here, there we go. And then I can click on it and then there was that link, but I just put a dummy link. So it's probably not going anywhere. Um, now once the image is in there, I can hit edit and I may want to change the size. I'll maybe go, yeah, I actually want the large size because it's too big for the download and I may want to align it. Um, there's advanced options here, update. And so what that will do is bring in the small one. Let me exaggerate that so you can see what I'm doing. So there you go. So now that's the smaller size. So you can use the different sizes. So now let's just jump back to the gallery that we had before that we're all loading. So there we go. There it's made thumbnails and three columns. We can click on that and there's the image link. So that's the media gallery and inserting images into WordPress. Okay. So let me jump to the next on the list, uh, which is managing website authors. Okay. So now I'm going to, um, I, oh, okay. I'm just going to jump into slightly just into comments quickly. Um, so you can see here I'm using the, um, the these interface to jump to the front end and back end. I'm just going to jump to comments. Um, I recommend that you switch off comments so you won't need to come in here. Um, however, if you are using comments, this is where the um, the they the displayed. You can unimprove, you can spam them, trash them. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, now this is interesting here because. Remember I said when you switch off comments, it's for comments coming forward. Now in this context, the WordPress installed a blog post when I installed it called Hello World. This is standard and it's installed a comment. Now it does this to show you what the things are. That means that if you leave this, then um, people, are go, people then can start spamming it. So if you're getting spam, if you're getting comments and you're like, I've turned off comments, you can come in here and see which actual posts or pages still have it switched off. So then you can go, oh, okay. So I'm going to go to the, go to this post and then I'm going to come down to comments. I'm like, where are comments? Oh, I remember now the screen options, they're hidden. So I'm going to just switch them back on and then, oh, look, they're switched on. So I'm going to switch them off and then they'll stop people being able to um, add to it. Now, because this is just a dummy um, post anyway, that just makes sense just to trash it and then the comments don't work anyway. Okay, so there's the comments. Now I'm gonna move to actual people and edits. So if you've got a team that's working on your website, this is this section. So let's go to users. Now it's really important for you to not give share a username and password. So you don't want one account to your WordPress and then three people use it. There's a few reasons for that. One is that if you forget your password, you can do a password reset. They'll lock everyone else out. So they do a password reset and you're just playing password ping pong. The other reason is that you actually want to, in the, um, the revisions, it actually shows you what users are doing what. So if someone accidentally makes a mistake, you know who did it and when they did it. So for example, I had a client once said, oh, the website's broken, can you fix it? And then I was like, yeah, so at 4.56 on Thursday, you broke this bit and uh, I could tell who had done what. So it's really um, important to do that. It also means that if somebody's no longer relevant to your team, you can then remove them as a user. So, uh, so we come into users here and we go add new. 
username. Um, so let's just use um, Mary. Now we need the email address, Mary uh, Action Skills .co. Now these the rest of this, these three things are optional. So if you've got a small team, if there's three of you, you know who Mary is. So you don't need first and last name. Unless you're a blog and you actually want to display that in your theme. Now, if you've got a bigger team or you want to display that, then you would put their actual um, full name, but this is optional. Um, website again, password. Now see how that password is really long and complex. This is good security. So I'll be doing a webinar later and it's something that I on security. And there's one thing that I uh, nag repeatedly to everybody I work with is strong passwords. This is what a strong password looks like. And no, you're not going to be able to remember it. Um, that's why you need to use a password manager to help you remember passwords. Because remember I introduced the webinar and said that there's a lot of automated hacking spam. That means um, automated robots are trying to hack your website. If you have a weak password, you will get hacked. So this is really, really key thing. If you're going to use WordPress, you need to have good, good um, passwords. However, if you're using anything like a bank or anything secure, you also need a good password as well. Um, so the tick part is send the user an email about their account. So yes, if it's a new user, I want to send that to them. So what happens when that will send them an email and then Mary gets a chance to change her password. Now, I recommend that you have agreement with all your team to use strong passwords. We don't want Mary changing that back to some really insecure password. Now roles are really important and I'll just pull them up. Um, WordPress roles codex and I'll pull these off the WordPress site. Now, different people have different, different roles um, in the website. I generally will give everybody um, full control. Okay, so here are the different um, definitions here. So super admin, that's the first person that signs up. So in that, on this website, that's me. Administrator, um, recommendations for good password keepers. I'll get to that at the end of the webinar. Uh, administrator has full access to the website. So they can control plugins, they can install themes, they can do all the settings, they can break things, um, they can do all the things. An editor can't do any of the tech stuff. They can publish and manage posts, including other people's posts. An author can publish their own posts, but can't edit anyone else's. A contrib contributor can, um, can um, send posts to review, but they can't publish them. And a subscriber can't do anything. So if you've got a hierarchical structure to control your content, then this is when you would um, implement this. Generally, I set anyone that's got any technical cap understanding and an administrator, because I think it's important that people learn the tech and they can help manage the website as a team, you know, do your updates and those sort of things. Um, but if they're really technically, you know, really don't like tech, then I'll just make them an editor. So they're the different uh, use and roles capabilities. So in this case, I'm going to make um, Mary a editor and add that. Then it'll list all of our users here. So then we can edit them and change them. Now, sometimes they may not get that email or they may have um, had issues with it. Or maybe their password reset's not working. So let's play a scenario when we've signed Mary up and then Mary can't access the website. So in that case, what I can do is I can go edit and I can send her the, the address to log in, which is this one. Then I can come down here and I can reset her password. Then I can just email her um, with, a, with a, a star, um, send to her her password and her username. And then Mary would then be able to log, log in and then change the password and do that. Now, by when I said put a star in the email, do not send passwords over email. So email is an open format. It's a bit like a postcard versus an envelope in the mail. 
So email is um, in, in the snail mail. So email is like a postcard, which you write all the stuff on and anyone that uh, can see what's on that postcard. So email is very insecure. So what I recommend is that if you use a encrypted email service, so Proton email to Proton email is an example of encrypted email, or you may use Signal app on your phone, or you may use Wicca or WhatsApp or one of these encrypted platforms. So it's really important that you get into the, um, into the good process of only sharing passwords via encrypted channels. Or you may have a project management software that's got encryption or that sort of thing. So there's your users. Um, uh, okay, introduction to themes. So I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction to themes um, because um, we're going to do a whole webinar on themes. Um, so I'm just gonna give a quick introduction. So what a theme is, is the theme manages the look and layout of your website and also some functionality as well. So this is where you come to add your themes and to change them around. Now, general WordPress ones suck, so you, you generally will be adding a new theme. Um, however, I'm gonna go through that in more detail during the theme um, presentation. Whenever you install a theme, the uh, WordPress comes with a customizer. Now, this is where there's various settings for your themes. Um, so here we can change some colors. So this interface will be different depending on your theme. So I'm just showing you when you install a theme, click on this and just have a look at what, um, where things are. You might be able to find things um, to edit. Some themes also will have another, another um, tab in the menu down here. So they may, um, so you've got some settings in there. Theme editor. I always switch this off. Um, I think this is the reason WordPress allows you to access this is so because they want people to lift the bonnet and start playing with the code. Um, this is really bad um, to edit themes in the WordPress interface. And here's why. If you make a, a um, formatting error with PHP, and it could be as simple of one brackets in the wrong spot or one full stops in the wrong spot, you'll get a white screen of death. So that means your website just stops working completely but you can't then get back in here to fix the edit and then you've broken the website. So I recommend not going in there and switching it off. Um, okay, so introduction to plugins. And again, I'm just gonna be really quick here because again, we've got another webinar on plugins. Um, plugins are like apps on your phone. So this is where you add functionality. Um, so you could add calendars, you can, you can add image galleries that are fancier than the WordPress one. You can do all sorts of booking engines, um, maps. There's thousands and thousands of plugins. Now with the next webinar on plugins and themes, I'm gonna go through a process of how to find good plugins, how to install them and how to think about them. Um, but this is where, where they go if you wanted to play before that webinar. And again, it's got an editor. Again, don't use it straight there. Okay, so I'm gonna jump now to widgets. Now widgets is a very um, bad name. However, in the early days, way back in, in the stone ages of WordPress, WordPress didn't have this functionality and this was a plugin called widgets. And WordPress went, oh, that's a really great um, plugin. We'll just make it core part of the main software. Um, so what widgets allow you to do is it allows you to put, and let me just jump to a page. It allows you to put bits of content in theme. So let me rephrase that. So normal web page, we can edit just this text bit. We can edit this bit and we can edit that bit. But there's nowhere else to be able to put other stuff. So you might wanna have a sign up page on all, all your pages or you may wanna have another sub menu or you may wanna have just a, an advert for something. So what widgets allow you to do is to do that. So this, these down here is the widget sections. Now Norm, with most websites that looks like, and I'll just pull across this page, generally the widget section is here. So if I go to my webinars page, actually, no, sorry, I lie, it's just here. This, this is a widget on the right hand side. So generally that's how widgets are displayed. 
um, specifically in this theme, though we've got the widgets down here. So it's a, a spot in your theme where you can put stuff. Um, it's a <laughs> less technical way of doing it. Okay, so in this case, and, and different themes have different widget areas. So they're the areas where you can put widgets. Um, so this has got footer one, footer two. So if I jump to here, that'd be the left column and the right column, I assume. So we'll play with it to confirm that. Now with um, this website, it will have a right sidebar widget area to put the um, sign up form there. And so you can just grab widgets and stick them there. So this is the archive, the archives. So this is all my blog posts. Maybe I wanna put another menu. So there's, and I'll talk about menus in a bit. Maybe I wanna put a search. So site search. So there's all these different um, widgets that we can add in. We can also find plugins that create widgets. So if you say, oh, I want my Instagram feed uh, on my sidebar, then one approach could be that you install an Instagram plugin that creates an Instagram widget, and then you can then drag that to your sidebar. Um, this widget um, infrastructure is becoming less relevant for with when we're using page builders. So if we're using Divi or Elementor as a page builder, then um, these things aren't very relevant. However, we still do use them in Divi and Elementor, uh, and we use them for two, two reasons. One is that we wanna keep things simple. So in this case, I'm not using the Divi Builder and I'm just using default WordPress. I'm keeping it simple. So I'm still using the widget system. The other uh, pro reason why I would use widget system is some plugins that create widgets, um, it's the best, it's the, technically the easiest way of doing it. So for example, this archives, it lists the archives. That's a really good way of doing it. So therefore um, I can then in my page builder, put in a widget area and then put the widgets in it that way. Um, and I'll be able to show you how to do that when we go through the Divi uh, webinar. So, but in the, in the short term, um, so if I, with a normal basic theme, then the widgets will manifest like this. So if I reload this page, there you go. There's the search that I put in. I put in another archives. Okay, so say we want to get rid of the comments, um, recent comments, I'm just going to drag that off. I'm going to take off the post. We've got two searches. So now if I reload this page, there we go. I've, I've edited those things. I'm going to run through menus. Okay, now menu. A menu. Uh, okay, so menu is this thing at the top. Now, you should all know what a menu is at this point. Um, they're pretty normal on a website. So this is the sort of um, the navigation of your website. So I'm going to show you how to manage them in WordPress. So we go to appearance menus. Now at the moment, this website uh, by default doesn't have any menus. So at the moment, it's just going to display all the pages that I've, I've added. Now that's a bit, if you have three pages and you're happy with that, fine. But generally, I mean, I've never built a website where I haven't actually created a menu. So I'm, and you can create multiple menus. So you could create a menu for the footer. So you could create footer and then put that in that widget area that we we're looking at just before. But I'm going to make a primary menu. Now you can call them whatever you want. Um, however, I always try to use language that makes sense. So someone else, if they come to my website, that can make sense. WordPress uses the language primary quite a lot for the, the main menu. So in that context, that's this menu at the top here. Um, so I, I always call mine primary. You may call it main navigation. You may call it top navigation. Just call it something that makes sense. So I'm gonna hit create menu. Um, now it says here the display location. Okay, so on a desktop, it's horizontal. And on a mobile, we're gonna show mobile. So um, I haven't used this theme before. So they've got a few options here. So generally we'll just play with where they, where they pop out. Um, but generally, um, the, yeah, it's much more simple. So I'm just gonna hit save. So this will now display this at the top of my website. And I've got no menu items, so that's disappeared. Now, if we have a look here at the social menu, that's interesting because I'm gonna guess that if I create another menu and call it social, and then I put as links my social media accounts, I assume that that's gonna then create um, 
with icons and things. I'm not sure. That's something I could play with. Okay, so to add, add items to the menu, what we do is we just come here, here's my pages. So I'm gonna add my two pages that I've created and I'm gonna add it to the menu. Hit save, and there they are. Beautiful. I wanna change the order, that's fine. I just drag and drop. If I want to change what they say, so just say that I, the page is called sample page, but I just want it to be called sample in the navigation. This is really um, important if you've got long page titles, but your navigation, you just want them short. So if I save that, and there we go. Now, people uh, like to use drop down menus. I really don't like them, and I use them really rarely. But if someone insists on a drop down menu, what we do is we just indent it. So this is indented here. That becomes a drop down menu. There we go. There's your drop down menu. Now we've got a few options here. So post. So just say I want to put a post in my menu, I can just do that. And if I want a category of posts, so I want all my design stuff in the posts, I can do that as well. And uh, there we go. And that's all my design posts there. Now this custom links, this is really powerful. So this allows me to go to any other website. Um, and I might go action skills. That allows me to just add any. So just say you've got a donate um, function and it's on uh, Raisley on an external website. You can then put donate at the top of your navigation and then link across to Raisley. And then that will link now to action skills slowly because I'm on Zoom. There we go. Now this is also useful to link to pages where there's no option. So here I'm looking, just say I want to link to my Glenn Todd archive. Remember I showed you that before. Um, all the posts by Glenn. I'm not sure if we can see that again. Anyway, um, so uh, let's now let's show that um, example. So if I go to posts, all posts, um, graphics by Glenn. Okay, so just say I want to have all the posts by Glenn in the navigation. So I can just grab that. And if I go back to my menu, see there's no option for author. So I can just go to custom link stick that in there and put Glenn's posts. So this custom link is sort of the magic button to do things that you can't otherwise do, as well as go to external websites. So there we go. Um, we are Glenn's posts. I click on that and there's all my posts. Um, and, and then I'm just going to, then I'm going to create a new menu because we can have multiple menus. I'm going to try this social one. Let's see what the social one does. And I'm going to create menu and then I'm going to do a custom link and I'm going to say go Facebook and then I'll go HTTPS Facebook.com action skills and then um, add that to menu click on social menu. So that's uh, a similar to a widget area. It's somewhere in the theme where they're going to display the menu. Uh, and let's just see what happens. Where is it? Um, there we go. It's there. And that's a Facebook icon and it goes to my Facebook. Okay. So my guess was correct. Um, and so that's theme dependent. So that'll change depending on your theme. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to run through with you is the tools. Um, and specifically the import export function. So WordPress is really good because you can trans, you can move the content. So there's two ways of migrating a WordPress website. One is if you want all the themes and all the plugins and the whole entire website, that's a bit more of a complex approach and I'll show that in other webinars. But if you just say, oh, I just want to move my content, that is your images, your blog posts, your pages, then you can come here and go export and then you can choose what you want. So I want to choose all my stuff and then download export file. And it will just save an export file. Then you go, then you've got another WordPress website and you go, I want to import that stuff. You can just come to here and hit import and it will install a plugin 
and then allow you to install that content. So it's really easy to move content across WordPress sites. So this is really useful because remember at the start, we we're talking about wordpress.com and you, you might be, oh, I'm not sure if I can be bothered with wordpress.com. I'm just going to give wordpress.com. I can't be bothered with wordpress.org. I'm going to give wordpress.com a go just to, um, until I decide that I want to do WordPress or maybe I'm busy right now. I'm going to do a quick wordpress.com website just to hit my deadlines and then I'll move it later. Um, so you can then um, export it out of wordpress.com and just import it into your wordpress.org. So um, that's really quite easy. Um, so then you just choose that file um, and bang, open, upload file. And then it'll ask you, where do you want to put your, your posts? So uh, I could assign them to Glenn or Mary, or I can create a new user and it'll, it'll create a new user and put those posts to. So that's a really uh, useful tool for moving content. That won't change your plugins and it won't move your themes though. It's only for your content. But WordPress content moves really easily. And the other thing that's in here is the site health. So this helps you debug issues with your website. So if we come down to here to pass tests, Things like my version of PHP, which is the language it's written in, the um, server, um, various things. So if your website's having problems, then there'll be a heap of information that's in here that can help you um, debug what's wrong with your website. So that is a close exactly on four o'clock um, on the basics of WordPress. So this is just a default uh, WordPress. And this is all the basics. So um, I've got more webinars coming up. I do a lot of WordPress training. Um, and let me pull across. So on Wednesday, I'll be doing plugins and themes. Um, and then from there, I'll be doing a, um, more of a case study approach. So I'll be looking at more advanced builds, um, doing sophisticated stuff with WordPress. Uh, then I'll be using doing um, training on Divi, which is a drag and drop interface. And I'll also play a bit with Elementor. And then I'll be talking about, um, with the next webinar, I'll be talking about um, managing your tech, optimizing it, securing it, um, looking after your website. So by if you do all the webinars, you'll be a very um, skilled at WordPress. So I hope to see you coming along. Um, and I do these um, webinars as pay what you feel. And so the link to the donation is in the email that I sent. Um, or you can just come to Action Skills and click Donate um, here. Uh, or if that's not your thing, um, then if you like or comment my YouTube videos, my Facebook posts, that's really helpful. Um, and what's really appreciative if you share my content and share my webinars so that I can, it helps to grow my movement so I can um, keep providing free resources to activists and support not-for-profit groups.